Good morning. We're live at Gear Expo 2017, and I'm Brandy Stott, Managing Editor of Power Transmission Engineering Magazine. And today I'm here with Chris Napoleon of Napoleon Engineering Services. Chris, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Today we're going to talk about the global supply chain for bearings. And my first question, Chris, is why is it important for us to be talking about this now? Well, if you walk, when you walk through the halls here at the Gear Expo, you can really see the international flavor. Uh, and everything from our clothes to our bearings are made uh, internationally. It's a global supply chain. Uh, it's the fact. But the, the reality is, is that a bearing is not a commodity. You know, it, from an engineering perspective, we've done a great job of allowing people to consider a bearing a commodity. Mm -hmm. However, that's not really true, and there can be great risks mm -hmm. uh, if we consider it a commodity. So, uh, you know, there are some steps that you have to do in order to be successful within that global supply chain. You can be successful, but you have to do your due diligence. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that uh, a bearing buyer has to do in order to qualify a new supplier? Great question. Well. There are some things that are internal to the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, that's looking to purchase bearings globally. Uh, the first is the acknowledgement that there is risk. Uh, you know, as I just indicated, if you just consider it a commodity, then uh, you haven't accepted that there is risk. So there's risk, and as a result, there's a cost associated with going through a process to uh, reduce reduce the risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, first is acknowledgement and setting a budget uh, to go through the proper steps. So that's number one. Uh, number two is, is identifying the suppliers and, and determining what structure they have. Are you buying direct from the bearing manufacturer? Are you buying through distribution? Or are you buying from a broker, mm -hmm. to name a few? And each of them have their strengths and also areas that you have to be evaluating and attentive to to be successful. Mm -hmm. so, th so the structure. The third thing is the engineering support that a potential new supplier is going to have. What I like to say is identify your baseline. So if you're used to calling up your local engineering representative and, and he or she says, I'll be there tomorrow, and mm -hmm. we'll go through the application, you become accustomed to that. And when we look at the true global supply chain, how is that new bearing manufacturer going to service you from an engineering standpoint? What are your expectations? Do they have boots on the ground, mm -hmm. I like to say? Uh, so your expectation should drive uh, your evaluation of what someone comes to the table with. Mm -hmm. that, that's number three. Uh, the next two are related to audits. So there's two types of audits that I believe are important when evaluating new source of supply. First is your quality audit. Okay. So your yep. own internal quality team goes to the plant and evaluates them from a quality system standpoint, from let's say an ISO 9001 standpoint. Mm -hmm. The next element is perhaps to uh, coordinate with a specialist in the bearing field to do a manufacturing audit. Bearings are like a black art, quite frankly, and there are a lot of things that are not in the catalog that define why a bearing works in the application. So you what, what sort of things are you talking about? Uh, well, the design. Mm -hmm. Many of the design characteristics are internal to each bearing manufacturer. Outside of the bore OD, with and uh, tolerances set forth in ISO or the AVMA standards, mm -hmm. it's up to the bearing manufacturer to establish their own internal limits for surface finishes and curvatures and contours uh, and, and cage design mm -hmm. and clearances and on and on and on, let alone material quality expectations, uh, heat treatment processes. So unless you are, a, you are in the bearings field and understand those, you're limited in your ability as an OEM to assess the quality of that manufacturer. So typically you contract that to someone who mm -hmm. 
is knowledgeable. So that's a very important step. So these are all things that have to be done, those five steps, prior to even touching the bearing, they're looking and testing the bearing. Mm -hmm. So the next three are things that sometimes are also contracted to a bearing specialist. And they're very criti critical steps. Inspection, modeling based on the inspection data that defines the intention the design intention of right. that manufacturer. Mm -hmm. It establishes how well that manufacturing plant carries out the design intention and their overall quality of workmanship. Mm -hmm. So now you're empowered with that inspection data to compare it to your baseline that perhaps has worked in the application or to simply compare it to national, international, and your in, in, uh, expert in the field of bearings, their standards. And you use that data to do the next next step, which is modeling. Okay. And we try to uh, estimate what the life will be based on these unique design characteristics. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, would be physical testing, environmental testing, dynamic life testing, to see how those bearing characteristics play out on equipment. Okay. So that's all the steps. There's a lot there. So if somebody goes through all those steps, how long does this process take? Well, you, Randy, it really depends on the criticality of the bearing within the application. Mm -hmm. So if we take some examples, uh, we all have to cut our grass in the summertime. So let's use a, a lawn tractor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and on a mower deck for a lawn tractor, uh, everyone's washing it down their tractors and they get used uh, throughout the uh, the summer. So the manufacturers of that equipment, they want to make sure that those spindle bearings work well. Mm -hmm. But it's not the bearing in the hydrostatic gearbox driving it, mm -hmm. which is much more difficult to replace. And there could be warranties associated with that. So there's different risks between the mower deck bearing and the bearing inside a gearbox. Sure. Mm -hmm. So for the mower deck bearing, your process qualification may be six months. Mm -hmm. For transmission bearings, you may go through each one of those steps. Okay. So the risk associated with the application defines how deep you go into each of uh, okay. that makes sense. those eight steps. And how many OEMs would you say actually go through that process? I believe any OEM who purchases bearings in large quantity and can utilize the global supply chain for the use in their finished piece of equipment should be going through this process. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the major, anyone who is really interested in producing a quality product mm -hmm. goes through these steps in one way, shape, or form. Okay. It goes without saying. And tell me a little bit about the products and services of Napoleon Engineering Services and how you help through this whole process. Sure. So out of those eight things that are basic, we do, we will do the uh, manufacturing audit. I, mm -hmm. I will travel the world and, and support people in educating not only themselves, but the bearing plan as to what the quality requirements should be to produce a good bearing. Mm -hmm. uh, but in-house, in we do the inspection, the modeling, and the physical testing. Okay. Okay. And if we use that example of a mower deck bearing, they may do the inspection of the bearing to characterize uh, uh, the quality of the product. Mm -hmm. And then they may do an environmental test. They might jump right to a mud slurry or dust box as opposed to going, putting it out in the field mm -hmm. where you only have a few samples, we may be able to run uh, 16, 20 or more samples from different suppliers and within a month or two have real data. Okay. So. What kind of test rigs do you have in-house? Yeah, great. Uh, there are typically three styles of rigs. Uh, static impact test rigs uh, for people like for forklift manufacturers mm -hmm. where that mast guide bearing may see an impact yeah. load. Uh, our heavy equipment and agricultural 
manufacturers utilize our environmental rigs because the failure mode of the bearing is typically contamination and surface initiated failure. So we want to evaluate the seal in that case. Mm -hmm. How efficient is the seal? So we'll have mud slurry, dust box, dust sprays, okay. yeah. water sprays, mm -hmm. caustic solutions. Uh, and then thirdly is life testing. Mm -hmm. So we will test bearings to failure under certain uh, load, speed, uh, temperature, oil conditions, either to simulate the application or in a, simply a standard bearing test to evaluate okay. their conformance uh, to the, uh, the L10 life mm -hmm. or application conditions. Okay. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience about Napoleon Engineering Services or the global supply chain for bearings? Well, I I've been doing this for roughly 20 years or over 20 years now. and. Uh, sometimes I think that I, I keep repeating myself year after year, but you know, that's a good thing. It means that the process that I just described to you works. Mm -hmm. It's rel relatively simple and straightforward, but you, if you follow it, you can be successful. I don't think we have to be afraid of the global supply chain. We can uh, engage in it, work within it, within it, provided that we have a plan. Without a plan, you will not achieve success and with a plan and we're here to help you uh, mitigate those risks. So I would really appreciate the opportunity to talk to, to you and uh, the power transmission readership and those of your expo. Well thank you very much for your time. It's been great information. Thank you. You're welcome.